In this video, we are going to discuss what a quantum bit really is. Quantum bits are the generalized equivalents of classical bits. We can encode bits, the smallest units of non-trivial information, on any physical system with at least two well-distinguishable states. Low or high voltage running through a cable, change or no change in reflectivity on a CD, or magnetized and demagnetized sections on a hard drive. Quantum computers are based on similar physical systems except these quantum bits, or qubits for short, have a few unusual properties. For example, they can be in a blend of two values and thus store more information than their classical counterparts. To fully understand this lesson, you will need some basic knowledge of probability and trigonometric functions. Let's imagine for a second that we come across a spellbook full of strange magic symbols. These strange bar charts represent an object with two sides, one pictured as light, the other as dark. The magical artifacts described in the book seem to exist on a spectrum between these two extremes and they can even change over time. They also have another strange characteristic called a phase. The phase of each side is denoted with a horizontal line across the bar with the corresponding color. The higher the line is, the bigger the phase. But what could this strange magical artifact be? Upon carefully reading the book we find it's a coin, but not just any coin. Its creator was a wizard who wanted to cheat at heads or tails. We even find some of these coins lying around in an old chest. Right now it's make-believe, but later we will see how these magical objects relate to qubits. We immediately find out what the sides are. The dark face of the coin is marked with a zero, and the light face with a one. So far so good, but this imaginary coin has two more characteristics. One gives us the likelihood of getting a zero or one randomly upon catching the coin, and the other is the phase, which is a bit harder to understand. The first characteristic is fairly straightforward. We flip the biased coin and get either a zero or a one, and the way it's loaded will give us the probabilities. We could get ones and zeros 50-50% of the time, or we could load one of these coins so the chances become nine to one in favor of a zero, or one-fourth to three-fourth in favor of a one, etc. The wider the dark side of each bar is, the higher the probability that a zero comes up in the coin flip, and the wider the light side, the more likely that the coin flip yields a one. We can change the probabilities however we want, even to the point where we get zeros or ones 100% of the time. In a sense, we could also say that in these extreme cases, one of the sides disappeared completely. No matter how many times we flip the coin, we are never going to find it. Now let's say that our coin is so strongly enchanted that it's impossible to uncouple the load from which side is visible. The coin resting on the table means that we have a 100% chance of the same coin face showing every time we look at it. So picking the coin up and turning it around is the same as changing the load so the other side is showing all the time. Flipping the coin means changing the load so there is a 50-50% chance of either side coming up. Catching the coin means we suddenly and randomly change the load in a way that it comes to rest on the table. Or, in other words, there is a 100% chance of us finding it the way we left it. Another side effect of the spell is that the coin starts spinning whenever we leave it alone. The only way to stop this is to catch the coin and hold it down. In fact, the coin resting on the table only means that whenever we catch it, the same side comes up over and over again. It might be hard to see that in this case the spin is just an illusion, but for all intents and purposes, the coin really is resting. But according to the book, there are other ways of changing the load than just flipping, catching, or turning the coin around. The mage could alter the load regardless of whether the coin was spinning or resting on the table, and he could alter the probabilities however he wanted. This is why it is so deceptive that the coin is always spinning. You can never tell if the mage cast a spell on it or not, unless you call the flip and catch the coin. But this is not the whole story. Our magical coin has another, mind-boggling property, the phase. If it was a normal coin, anyone who can cast a spell could cheat by slowing down time and catching the coin whenever the correct side is facing up. But our mage friend wanted to make sure that only those can cheat who know how to load the coin. His solution is quite outlandish. 
Not only is the probability of heads or tails unaffected by which side is facing us while the coin is spinning, but the coin seemingly loses its faces while spinning, it becomes a swirly magical blur. Inside that magical vortex, the normal rules of the world do not apply. The phase only exists in this magical vortex, so there is no easy way of imagining it. But if you want to visualize the phase, consider this. It's almost as if the two sides of the coin could spin completely out of phase with each other. This would mean that the two faces spin at the same rate, but one is a bit ahead of the other. This is bizarre. For normal, non-enchanted coins, whenever one side is facing us, the other shows its back. This relationship is often called antiphase. But the enchanted coin can turn both of its sides towards us at the same time, or the two faces can meet at any angle. Not that this makes too much sense. We would like to emphasize that this is just a metaphor, so don't take it too seriously, and do not try to draw conclusions from it. The important thing to take away from this is, that much like the angle, the face can only vary between a lower and upper bound. Rotating a coin face around more than once causes the angle to reset and start over from the beginning, the same way as increasing the face beyond a certain point resets it. The other thing to take away from this analogy is that the face can only exist if there is a non-zero possibility of either coin faces coming up when we catch it. Otherwise, we could say that one of the coin faces have disappeared from the swirl and trying to determine the angle between the coin faces is meaningless since there is nothing to compare. At any rate, the face doesn't normally affect the probabilities of our heads or tails game, but the mage could perform some tricks that would make the load, and therefore the probabilities, change depending on the relative phase of the two possibilities. This is as far as the story about wizards and magic coins go. After exercising our imagination, let's try and create a mathematical model for this coin. First, it has two sides. A dark, so-called cat0 side, and a light, so-called cat1. Both of these sides have two properties each. One tells us the probability of a coin face showing when we catch it, the other is the phase. The sum of these probabilities has to be 100%. The reason for this is that we took into account all possible outcomes. The magic book represents this using a bar chart with a fixed unit length. The wider one side is, the more likely we will find our coin in that state when we catch it. The other property that we can associate with each side is the phase. We can think of the way the two sides of the coin are spinning as a periodic function. How much two periodic functions can be out of phase depends on the periodicity. We can only shift them so much before they start overlapping again. For the basic sine and cosine functions, the possible phase difference runs from 0 radian to 2 pi radian before it restarts due to 2 pi periodicity. To represent this constraint, we should consider the difference between the top and the bottom of our line charts to be 2 pi. Where the phase line is between these limits indicates the magnitude of the phase. The lower the line is, the closer we are to a zero phase, and the higher it is, the closer we get to 2 pi. It's important to note that all phase-sensitive tricks that we could perform only care about the relative angle of the sides, or, in other words, the difference between the phases. This means that we can turn both sides of the coin while it's spinning, or change the phase angles if you will, without anybody noticing. As long as we introduce the same change to both sides, the relative position remains unaffected. We can use this trick to our advantage many times throughout our calculations. We can change this so-called global phase freely if that's more convenient for us, since it doesn't affect the relative angles nor the probabilities. This also means that whenever the coin is loaded in a way that it shows only one of its sides, there is no point in talking about the phase. The other coin phase has disappeared completely, and any phase-sensitive trick we could perform is rendered inconsequential. Now that we are thoroughly familiar with our fictitious qubit coin, let's see how it differs from actual qubits. The answer, at the core, mathematical level, it doesn't. Magic is real, and it's called quantum mechanics. 
The truth is, the only reason we talked about magical coins is because no one asked how or why something works if it's magic, and asking that very question would hold you back at this stage. Remember, this entire story is here to illustrate an axiom. It's natural to ask why things work the way they do, but if you start questioning an axiom, soon you will find yourself in a corner with no way out. It's like questioning why parallel lines do not meet, or why every number is equal to itself. Axioms are the most basic things we know, so we cannot explain them, simply because there is nothing more basic to explain them with. With that in mind, let's review what we learned about our qubits. A qubit is a quantum system. It can be a particle, a superconducting circuit, or even a molecule, as long as it obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. Any qubit can be in two different states. These states can be any physical property of a quantum system. Its energy, spin, polarization, etc. And finally, these states are distinct. If someone gives us a hundred particles each in one of these distinct states, then using the right measurement we could determine which was which with perfect accuracy. We are going to denote these distinct states with asymmetrical brackets, and usually we will label them with binary numbers increasing from zero. We pronounce these symbols as cat0 and cat1. Each of these states is associated with a complex quantity called probability amplitude. We can derive both the probability and the phase from this probability amplitude. If you are familiar with complex numbers, you might be interested to know that the phase can be calculated as the complex phase, while the probability can be calculated as the absolute value square of this complex quantity. But a quantum system can be in non-distinct states as well. These are a strange blend of cat0 and cat1 states, sort of how a spinning coin is a blend of both sides, the proper technical term for this blend is superposition. You may have heard about this phenomenon. Casually, we often say things like, electrons can be particles and waves at the same time, Schrödinger's cat can be both dead and alive, and, in the double slit experiment, electrons can pass through the left and right slit at the same time. But in a strict sense, these statements are all wrong, or at least misleading. Why? Because they use words like and and both. These terms have a clear-cut meaning. They mean both parts of the statement are true under all circumstances. For example, if you were to ask for ham and eggs at a diner, then you would expect to get both, regardless of whether it's night or day, whether it's sunny or rainy, and especially regardless whether the supervisor is watching the chef preparing your meal or not. Yet this is exactly the case for superposition. The measurement changes the measured system. Remember, catching our coin changes both the load and the phase. If we measure the bit value of a qubit in superposition, then the qubit value becomes either a cat0 or a cat1. The same way as catching the enchanted coin collapses the magical swirl and forces the coin to show either one side or the other, but never both at the same time. So this concludes our basic introduction to qubits. It might be quite a handful to grasp at first, but remember, the main points are qubits have two distinct values, a cat0 and a cat1. They each have a characteristic parameter called probability amplitude, and both of these probability amplitudes can be described with two real numbers a probability that we will find our qubit in the corresponding state, and the phase, which describes how these probabilities relate to one another. That's all you have to remember. Thanks for watching, and see you at the next video.